what I do. Um, we're starting out this Sunday with communion. The first Sunday of each month, we stop and pause and remember the life, the death, the burial, the resurrection, and the ascension of Jesus. All across the world today, Christians are stopping to take bread and juice or wine and wafers and pause for a minute and remember that death has been defeated, that the kingdom of darkness is over, and the kingdom of Jesus the Christ is rushing in. And so today, by taking this bread and this juice, we are remembering that because of his death, we can live his life. Because he lives again, we need not fear death. We stop and remember that life doesn't end in death. Life ends in more life because of Jesus. Because of Jesus, we can know God. So, with me, take the bread.
you can stay there for free whenever you want. And my parents were like, free Florida? Vacation? Off? And they're like, where is it? In the middle of the... They're like, no, it's on the coast. And we're like, oh my gosh, this is awesome. We're going to go down there and take advantage of this. I think we have a map up here. It's in a, a town called Steenhatchy. You know Steenhatchy? Yeah. It's a dump, okay? So we get down there. The, it's near the shore, but the shore is all swamp through there. For about 100 miles in both directions, it's all swamp. You gotta drive about three hours to get to a real beach. It's just swamp and alligators. And we would go outside and it was just sand fleas and these little birds, these little seed birds that would get all over your clothes and poke you. And it was literally, it was just a miserable week. There was nothing to do, nothing was nearby. And we sat in this house and all they had was a 15 VHS collection about evolution versus creationism. And we just sat there bored. It was like one of our worst vacations of the year. But it, they had pitched it as this great thing. Um, I remember people telling me I love chicken sandwiches. And uh, people told me the Popeye's chicken sandwich is amazing. They're like, it's life changing. And I saw the ad. You can't see it up here very well. The ad is beautiful. You get it, it's this flat little deflated thing over here. It is not amazing. It doesn't hit. It did not hit. That's right. Sometimes we're given unrealistic expectation and reality brings us crashing back to earth and that's painful and disorienting. For John the Baptist, Jesus wasn't meeting his expectations of what the Messiah would be like and it was causing him to have a crisis of faith. If you go back to Matthew chapter 3 verse 11, John, uh, uh, I mean, uh, John the Baptist celebrates Jesus. He's like, you're the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. He goes, I'm not even worthy to untie your shoes or to retie your laces. You're so far above me. You're the Master. You're the Messiah. You get to Matthew chapter 9, verse 14. John hears about Jesus partying with tax collectors. In fact, a tax collector named Matthew who's writing this account and his friends. And John sends followers to Jesus and he's like, Hey, I think you need to fast a little bit more and party a little bit less. And now in Matthew chapter 11, he's in prison and he's like, you know what? I think I should be looking for somebody else. You're not the Messiah I was expecting. You've been a disappointment. John finds himself in prison because he confronted Herod Antipas around 30 AD about having an affair with his brother's wife. Now, there's a lot of Herods in the Bible. I think we have a, uh, yeah really hard to see, but this is the family tree of Herod. There's a lot of Herods in the Bible because they all kept naming their sons and brothers Herod, Herod this and Herod that. You literally, you pretty much need a PhD in uh, ancient Palestinian history to understand the Herod family tree. But, quick overview, around 30 AD he had an affair with his brother's wife, killed his brother Herod II, all kinds of other shadiness. Um, he's sometimes called Herod the Tetrarch because they split the role of Palestine into, into quarters. Tetrarch just means quarter. He was the ruler appointed by Rome to oversee the section of Palestine um, that included Galilee, where Jesus did most of his ministry. And this is the same guy who's involved in the crucifixion of Jesus, where Jesus is sent back and forth between Pilate, the regional governor, and Herod, the local ruler of Galilee. It's the same Herod that arrests John for publicly contending his affair and cover up. But he also arrests John because John was out there claiming there is a new king, the rightful king of the Jews, who has arrived to rule Israel. And Herod Antipas didn't like that. He's like, I'm the king. Not Jesus, not someone new. Herod Antipas' father, Herod the Great, was the one in the birth story of Jesus who um, killed all the, the children two years and under. Anybody remember that from the Christmas story? That was this guy's dad. And now this guy is imprisoning John the Baptist. So Herod, ultimately, this Herod Antipas, around 39 AD gets accused of plotting. This is outside the Bible. This is just in history. Gets accused of plotting against the new Roman emperor. Is found guilty of conspiracy and exiled to Gaul, which is like southern France in modern times. But at the time, it was the frontier of the Roman Empire, full of primitive tribes and people, and there he ends up dying. But put yourself in John's shoes, okay? He's been announcing this Roman-appointed king, Herod Antipas, is not the king. 
There is a new king that is coming. He's arriving to save us and set us free from Roman occupation. Jesus is king. And like a herald, he's gone before him to announce his arrival. And now he's been imprisoned by it, by the dark spiritual forces ruling the world through corrupt and violent kingdoms of men like Rome. And he's waiting. And he's like, any day, Jesus is going to go out, blow the shofar, raise an army, and march on Herod's palace and set me free. He's like, I've been out there in the streets saying, Jesus is king. The kingdom is here. The kingdom is coming. And he's like, I've been in prison for it, but Jesus is going to march on this palace and set me free. And John's followers keep coming into the prison and saying, hey, here's the update on Jesus. He's like, what's Jesus doing? Is he gathering an army? Is he making weapons? Is he calling down fire from heaven? And they're like, uh, he taught 5,000 people about loving their enemies. And John's like, no, that's wrong. That's not what he should be doing. And so they come back in, and they're like, here's another update, John. John's like, okay, what did he do? Did he take over the cities of the south, and he's marching towards Jerusalem? They're like, uh, he was partying with some tax collectors and sex workers last week. And he's like, no, like, that's not what you're supposed to be doing. And John is getting frustrated and impatient, and the whole time he's sitting in a prison, and he knows execution is on the table, and at any point he could die, and he doesn't understand why Jesus isn't making any effort. Like, doesn't he realize he's suffering for the cause when Jesus is out there making wine at wedding parties? For hundreds of years, rabbis have argued over what the Messiah would be like. Most felt like he would be a miracle-working warrior king who would supernaturally defeat Rome, establish Israel as the greatest nation on earth, and make Torah observance, uh, following the law, and Yahweh worship, make it like the rule and way for the entire world. One rabbi, Akiba, a few decades before Jesus, he described the Messiah like this. The Messiah will catch stones from Roman catapults on his knees and then kick them back to the Romans, killing hundreds with every hit. That's how he described what the Messiah would be like. Now, if you're thinking that sounds like Superman, you're not wrong. Like, it sounds like Superman. The original creators of Superman were Jewish. Uh, I think we have a picture of him. If you want to go to the next slide, you can't see that at all. But that's writer Jerry Spiegel and artist Joe Shooter. They created Superman in 1933, and both were sons of Jewish families who had fled persecution in Europe. Superman's real name is alien name. Clark Kent is his human name, but his alien name is Cal El, which literally means in Hebrew, the voice of God. El is the Hebrew word for God. So these Jewish guys weren't, uh, they weren't hiding what they were doing here. They're like, we're literally creating a comic book about what we think the Messiah will be like. And we're literally calling him the voice of God. Super strength, super endurance, flight, x-ray vision, laser eyes, cross breath. That's what John the Baptist was expecting. That's what he thought his disciples would come in and be like, yeah, Jesus just wiped out a battalion of Romans with his laser eyes. And instead, they were coming in and saying, no, 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 he's doing something very different. John is hearing these stories of Jesus and he's saying, this isn't what I signed up for. This isn't what was promised. I wouldn't have stuck my neck out if I knew this is how you were going to act, Jesus. I wouldn't have stuck my neck out if I knew I was going to end up in prison and you weren't going to do anything about it. The man who had stood in the desert with gnats in his hair. The sand that he walked was also his bed. The words that he spoke made the people assume there wasn't too much left in the upper room. Sorry, I had to do a little Jesus freak. Okay, we're talking about John the Baptist. This Jesus freak who so boldly proclaimed Jesus as Lord was now looking for someone else to worship. In just a short window of time, he went from standing in the desert, screaming and shouting to the religious and the powerful people, Jesus is Lord, to say, you know what, I'm looking for a new king. And I felt like that. And I'm sure many of you have felt like that as well. What we were promised about Christ, or many times what we were promised about Christianity, doesn't measure up or didn't measure up to what we experience, and that feeling can leave you with a crisis of faith. Often people were so eager, especially when I was younger, when I was a teenager, people were so eager for me to become a follower of Jesus, they tried to sell me on the idea. And unfortunately, sometimes they made false promises that Christianity could never deliver. I remember this phrase was repeated in youth group all the time in church, no guilt in life, no fear in death. I've been following Jesus now for 35 years, and I want you to know I still fear 
I have less fear because I believe there's a resurrection, but I am still afraid of death. And no guilt in life. There are plenty of times I still feel guilty, and there are times even the Spirit of God uses guilt to get me to repent and change direction. This is just a false claim. Another thing I heard in churches was name it and claim it, and you can be sure God will do it. Well, you know what? I've named and claimed that people wouldn't die. I had all the faith in the world that they wouldn't die, and they still die. And even if they didn't die then, they would die eventually. It's just not a promise that Jesus made, and it's not a promise that is true. This is one I heard over and over again. Keep the rules. Obey God. Do things His way, and life will be easy and simple and safe. Um, there was a movie in the early 2000s, it was a Christian movie, I won't call it out by name, they played it in every church, you know, and churches were having screenings of it, and it was the first kind of like, one of those Christian movies that like, got really big and popular, and um, at the end of the movie, they show this clip of a preacher, and he says, I'm going to paraphrase it, but he says, you ever wonder why your life's messed up? Why you're feeling sad and depressed and everything's messed up in your life? It's because you don't know Jesus, because you're not doing things Jesus' way. If you just obey Jesus, everything would work out. And at the end of the movie, this guy who couldn't have kids magically has kids. And this guy whose job was ruined, suddenly his job all works out. And everything works out for his life because he gets his life right with Jesus. And that's a lie. And if you think that's going to happen... Live a couple years, and you will be disappointed. Jesus never promised an easy, simple, and safe life. And it's a lie when we tell people, if you just become a follower of Jesus, everything's going to work out, and you won't have any problems anymore. Another disappointment, I think a false salesman approach that I had was, um, people would say, your faith will cure your sickness. Well, sometimes God heals, and sometimes he doesn't. But you cannot like blame sick people that they're still sick because they didn't have enough faith. Another one is that church will be a community and family that will always love you. Man, I wish that was true. But that has not been the reality that I've experienced. And I know a lot of people who have come into churches looking for someone to love them and they've been disappointed. Here's how I saw one person online lament their experience in church. Christianity, they wrote online, sets people up with false expectations will bring in, which will bring in disappointment, self-loathing, and anxiety that will increase as your time in church progresses. They went on to say that they found relationships in church to be so shallow when they were so desperate to be seen and loved that they went away more disappointed than they had ever felt in their life before that, and they left the faith all together. Now, I think Jesus is the best path. I think he's the path to life. And living and loving like Jesus will make the world a better place. It'll make you a better person. But if you're one of the many who have had church experiences that have left you feeling hollow, if you're watching online or you're here, I just want you to say, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for the people who overpromised or promised something that Jesus never claimed he would provide. I'm sorry for how that has hurt you or frustrated you. Your pain is real, and I am sorry that the church was. Maybe today you're like, this hasn't lived up. This Christianity and this faith, this church hasn't lived up to everything I was promised. I'm thinking about looking for something new, something different. I get that. John the Baptist, who next week Jesus is going to call the greatest prophet who ever lived, he felt that way too. I follow a number of people on social media who have left Christianity over the last few things, over the last few years, over things that were promised that they never saw. And many of them now tell people how they found the happiness they were always looking for in yoga, or in CrossFit, or in Sunday brunch. I have this one friend who almost every week is posting a picture at Sunday brunch, trying different cool hip restaurants, and he's like, I am finding joy that I've never found attending church every week. And I am truly and genuinely sorry for how churches have attempted to sell Jesus to you. But... To be fair, Jesus never talked about becoming his disciple like most churches do. He was very honest with us. In Luke 14, 33, he tells these series of parables, and he says, the point of all these parables are to tell you this, count the cost. 
He says, before you start building a house, count the cost and make sure you can afford it, because otherwise you'll have a frame up and everybody will laugh at you because you couldn't afford to finish it. He says, if you're going to go to war, count the cost and see if you can actually win the war. Because if you can't, you better sue for peace now because it's going to cost you everything. And he says, if you're going to follow me, you need to count the cost because it's going to cost you. In Matthew 16, 24, Jesus says this. He gets to the height of his popularity. Huge crowds are following him. And he says this. If you want to follow me, deny yourself. Pick up a cross, a Roman instrument of oppression and persecution and death, and follow me. It says that many people went away sad after that. Dallas Willard says, your cross is not something you don't like. That's what I usually heard in churches growing up. Like, I've got to bear this cross, you know. I've got this broken leg, it's my cross to bear. Or, you know, i got this, this stubborn child, it's my cross to bear. Dallas Willard says, your cross is not something you don't like in your life. It is the end of your self-will. It is giving up, getting what you want. That's what Jesus invites us to. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who fought against the Nazis as a pastor, when all the other pastors around him were just buying into the, um, the Nazi regime so that they could keep their church and keep their power, he stood apart and ultimately got killed. He says this, when Christ calls someone, to follow him, he invites them to come and die. Wow, that's a sales pitch right there, right? You know, that sounds great. You're not going to fill a mega church with that kind of messaging. If I came in here and I said, hey, believe it, name it, claim it, and God's going to do it. You want a Lamborghini, you want that new car, you want a better looking spouse, name it, claim it, and God's going to do it. I could get a lot more people in here. But it's not on it. Jesus isn't trying to sell us on the idea of all again, but he is very honest, and I think we need to be honest with people. Being a Christian doesn't mean life is easy or comfortable or safe. Sometimes life will be especially dangerous or uncomfortable because you're a Christian. We've often been promised from churches the American dream and been told that is the promise of Christianity, and when it falls apart, we leave Christ behind like a baby we're throwing out in the bathwater. Okay, let's step back and look at John again. New N.T. Wright, the New Testament scholar, compares Jesus and John as actors in a play together. And John knows his part. I'm supposed to announce the Messiah. But suddenly Jesus begins speaking and acting off script. And he's scared and alarmed and doesn't know what to do next. Um, a little known fact about me, but at the church I came from in Tennessee, each year I would write a Christmas play. And I would gather up high school students and college students to be in this Christmas play I wrote and then I would direct. Don't work with high school and college students if you want something done right. You know, like, I love them, but they would get their lines all wrong or some of them would just go off script in the middle of it. And you would watch all the other actors who had, who had learned their line, lines like, oh my gosh, I don't know what to do. It's not going the way I thought and I don't know what to do next. And that's exactly what N.T. Wright says John is doing. Now, it's impossible to know exactly what John was thinking, but the fact that he was so concerned about Jesus eating with tax collectors in Matthew 9 gives us some insight into how he must have been feeling. Here's N.T. right again. Just as some wicked people don't like a message of judgment because they think rightly that it's aimed at them, sometimes good people don't like a message of mercy because they think wrongfully that people are going to get away with wickedness. But mercy was at the heart of Jesus' messianic mission, just as it should remain at the heart of the church's work today. We don't know, but that could have been part of John's reasoning, that he's like, you're like butting up to the sinners too much, and I expect the Messiah to come out and be like, Torah law says this, Romans die, everybody else get in line with the law, let's follow the rules, let's be good Jewish believers. And notice the evidence that Jesus gives for being the Messiah. This is what he says to John's disciples. Go back and tell them this. The blind now see. The lame are walking. Those who have leprosy are cleansed. The deaf hear. The dead are raised and the good news is proclaimed to the poor. John wanted to see armies raised and sinners condemned and Roman legions wiped out and Jewish flags flying over Jerusalem and dead Roman soldiers in the streets. But it seemed like Jesus was working on a different script all and Jesus has this really simple message for John. 
If I was Jesus, I'd be like, God, please don't give up on me. Like, listen, I know what I'm doing is confusing, but just hold on. It's going to all make sense one day. Don't give up your faith. Like, hang on. But Jesus doesn't beg or threaten. He doesn't say, I'm the Messiah. You get in line. You like, don't you dare question me. He doesn't make any promises. He's not like, look, John, if you just hang on, I'll name it and claim something for you. You know, like, just hang on a little bit more. He simply says, Blessed are those who do not stumble because of who I am. The word blessed is the Greek word makarios. I think we have a Greek word up there that you can't see. Yep. Makarios. Anybody want to try saying that? Makarios. Learn this in Greek today. It means fortunate or privileged. It's sometimes translated happy. Dr. John Bechtel says this in the Greek word makarios. It was most often used by the ancient Greeks to describe their gods as makarios. Because they lounged around Mount Olympus all day, enjoying the privileges of divine power. The word was also used to describe the rich or those living free from the usual cares and worries of life. And Jesus said, you will be blessed if you don't give up your faith. If you just hold on, someday you will be glad you did not stumble because of who I am. And remember, Matthew, what he wants us to do with his biography of Jesus, he wants us to wrestle with the big question, is Jesus my king? Am I going to make Jesus my king? And he wants this response from Jesus to John to become a response from Jesus to us. Don't stumble on behalf of who I am. There is blessing on the other side if you don't give up your faith. Faith. Those of us who have lived long enough to be disappointed when we prayed and nothing happened, when we fasted and someone still died, when we kept the rules and everything we tried failed, when we were a faithful disciple and we ended up in prison awaiting execution, Jesus wants us to hear these words. Happy, blessed, fortunate is the one who doesn't lose their faith because of me. Blessed, fortunate, privileged. I want Jesus to make this compelling case for me. I really do. I want him to convince me to remain faithful when he feels like he has failed us. I want him to encourage me to keep going. Like, throw in some benefits. You know, like, when you're like, oh, man, they're, I'm about to lose these people. You know, like, what does a comedian do when he's, like, losing the crowd? He's like, some free drinks. Send some free drinks out to the crowd and keep them engaged. Keep them staying, right? But he doesn't promise anything. He doesn't try to sell us. He doesn't yell and shout and demand. Jesus says, hey, blessed is the one who doesn't lose their faith because of me. If you don't stumble, if you keep going, if you don't lose your faith, one day you will be glad to persevere. We just have to take him at his word. And for some of you, maybe watching online or here, that won't be enough. And I get that. I understand that. But Matthew wants us to stop and ask ourselves, what would make me give up on Jesus? For John, it would be Jesus doing things he didn't expect. Jesus leaving him to rot in prison, what would it be for you? What would make you give up your faith? Matthew wants us to wrestle with that. Is Jesus really our king? Or is he only our king as long as he does what we want? The way we want? The way that we expect? As long as he looks like the kind of king that we want? Or is he king no matter what? I also find it compelling that even when Jesus was hours away from death, right before the cross, when he was about to drink sin and evil drive, he wept in the garden and he begged his father, find another way. And when he went to the cross, he breathed out with his last rasping breath, my father, my father, why have you abandoned me? And so on the days that I feel disappointed and abandoned, I remember Jesus, my king. The king I serve is a person who has felt what it feels like to have your expectations dashed to have your dreams shattered, to feel isolated and alone and defeated. And somehow knowing that, knowing that my king knows firsthand what that feels like makes it easier for me to say, you are my king, I'm not going to give up today. I'm not going to stumble because of who you are today. I'm not going to give up, even though this has been a disappointment, even though this didn't meet my expectations, even though this didn't go the way that I wanted, even though this prayer went unanswered, even though I was promised all these things by what Christianity I thought it was and it wasn't, I'm not going to give up because you know what that's like in Jesus. This setup, this disappointment, this disaster is not the end. And sometimes long after those moments, 
Years later, I can look back and I can be thankful I did not give up or quit or turn my back on the faith. And in those moments, I feel blessed. I hope that today, if you feel like giving up or turning your back on Jesus, that you keep going because one day soon, you might look back and know that Jesus was right. That on the other side of this doubt, on the other side of this pain, on the other side of this disappointment, there is blessing beyond measure, whether that's in this life or the kingdom to come. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you that you are the king. And thank you that you are a king who understands all our weaknesses and all our pains and all our disappointments. You know what it's like to be rejected by those closest to you. You know what it's like to long for people to, to embrace what you're doing and then they all walk away. I'm grateful that you're a king who knows what it's like to live as a human. And so I come to you and I give my worship and my praise. And God, I serve you. You are my king and I am your servant. And there are moments when I am so hurt or so disappointed or so filled with grief I think I'm just going to give up on this thing. But it's by your strength we keep me going, we keep moving forward. And I can look back at those moments now and I feel blessed because I got through them. I pray for those watching or those here who are like, you know what, I think I'm done with this thing. It hasn't been everything I thought. It hasn't been everything I wanted. It's been disappointing, honestly. I'm disappointed in Jesus. I'm disappointed in God. I pray that they will hold on and keep going and that you will show them soon how you are blessing them through I pray this in the name you would pray. Amen.
we grab a coffee mug made by a local artist right here at the Art Center for you. This Tuesday, June 4th, we are having our community dinner at Ash Bridge Park at 6 p.m. Just bring up something to share with everybody and we'll have a great evening and the weather is supposed to be beautiful. If you would like to give to support the work that Horizon is doing, you can do so at relationshipsnotreligion.com or we have PayPal or Venmo or there's an office on the information table. This week, you find Jesus working poverty, even when it feels like all the reasons have evaporated. May you find the supernatural strength to keep your faith and find the unexpected blessing in your perseverance. You are dismissed.